Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Althwaite. I am a rheumatologist of the parishes of Marylebone in London and Headington in Oxford. For the last 30 years, all I have dealt with is people with chronic musculoskeletal pain. Now, if you're very lucky with your genes and you're very hypermobile, you can end up looking like this wonderful pair here. But the genes are tricky, and they will do all sorts of things that we do not expect them to do. So you can have hypermobility in one joint, you can have hypermobility in a few joints, you can have axial hypermobility, which really confuses people. And the wasn't until that long ago, I mean, people talk about it as though it was in antediluvian times, but this lady, Dr Barbara Ansell, who comes from the Ansell family in Birmingham, who make excellent beer and wonderful doctors, which in my book is a very good thing. <laughs> and she was appointed to the Canadian Red Cross War Memorial Hospital in Taplow as a registrar to research um, damage in hearts from rheumatic fever. Now, that's a condition we don't see much of anymore, but I'm sure it will be back like all the things that we don't really want. And she was the first person to really try and work out what was happening in children with inflammatory joint disease. And kids get all the joint disease that adults they get, they get the rheumatoid, and then they get their own special nasties like juvenile chronic arthritis and Stills disease. And she sorted all these kids out into their different bits and pieces. And then there was a group of children with chronic widespread musculoskeletal pain. And all that seemed to be wrong with them is they were just a bit bendy. So this is the first time that someone had really actually begun to delineate hypermobility. She was also the first person in this country to start to use multidisciplinary teams to work with the children and parents. Parents were usually left out of these things and she introduced all sorts of strange animals like psychologists and occupational therapists and physiotherapists. So she was a real groundbreaker. And she had an enormous effect on her parents. I, I saw a, a chap the other day for a completely unrelated item. He said, ooh, you're old and fat. You must remember Barbara Ansell. And I said, yes, actually, I, I just about do. Oh, she was wonderful, implying that I wasn't. But there you go. Um, anyway, they did good work at Taplow. And then that was moved to Wexham Park near Slough. And eventually the inflammatory work really went, I think, with Pat Wu to Northwick Park. And Professor Rodney Graham, who was working there at the time, and I don't know why I've got a picture of him here, because he's actually sitting in the front row, so you can see him in the flesh, if you, if you want, carried on her, her work, and he realised that there's a lot more going on in hypermobility than just having elasticated joints. Um, now, this is a spectrum disorder, and... At one end, at one end of the spectrum, we have people with really actually quite catastrophic problems with organ failure, their eyeballs run into trouble, their hearts run into trouble, their aortas run into trouble, and they're quite rare. I probably see, and remembering that all I've done is look after people with chronic musculoskeletal pain for years, probably see one or two of these a year. Um, and the the way that we break them into groups keeps changing. And that the last time I looked, which was about six weeks ago, there were seven different forms of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. You keep on finding a 2B or a 3A or a 4C is added all the time. So don't get confused about that. Just go with the general flow. The people we see more of are the hypermobiles. And you all know how they look and what happens. And they're meant to be about 10% of the male population, 20% of the female population in this country with Caucasian genes. They probably, in London, are 60 to 70% of my clinic is full of people who've got hypermobility-related -mobil problems. They tend to cluster around the arts and media because either they're good at it or their parents were good at it. So you do find huge numbers of them. The further east in the planet you go and the further south in the planet you go, the more hypermobile people become. And there are hot spots of hypermobility in places like Brazil. And wherever you get a mixing of the genetics, you suddenly get lots of people with, with hypermobility. So the, the genes are all over the place. And... <laughs> 
doctors are, are, are very irritating. So you go up to me and say, I really want a definition of how you do the hypermobility and this. And, and please remember, it's only taken 400 million years for these little devils to get their act together and form living organisms. And the, the, the genes are very tricky. They'll, they'll suddenly come out, they'll, they'll suddenly hide. You have the whole science of epigenetics going on behind them. So it's going to take a few more years before this is all settled down and you'll start to get a proper taxonomy of what's actually, actually going on. So the thing is, whenever you have an hypermobile patient in front of you, they are individual. They will have a gene set, an expression of those genes, which is subtly different from the other people. So you have to treat each person individually and not say, well, actually, you're in that category or in that category and look out for all the other problems you have. Uh, Rodney, this is your T-shirt. It may not be your colour, but it is your T-shirt. They have all sorts of other problems. They have dysautonomia. Their, their bowels don't work properly. Their bladder doesn't work properly. They get catastrophic problems with the pelvic diaphragm. Um, their heart will beat fast. They have problems where their blood pools if they stand up with POTS. They have mitral valve prolapse. Some people are relatively immune to local anaesthetic, which is an odd one. And if you look, they have different yeah. tissue markers and their tissues don't heal so well, they don't stand up to surgery as well as we'd like. So there's a lot more going on than just being a bit flexible. There are also problems with the central neurophysiology. Um, if you are going to try bull jumping, I would suggest starting with a very small one with no horns. That's usually more comfortable. Um, and when you're doing something that's a repetitive learned action like this, you have to keep reminding your brain how to, how to do it. I forget which famous musician said, if I stop practicing, I notice after a week and my audience notices after three weeks. But this is true. And the problem with hypermobiles is that they're more likely to get pattern abnormalities in the way that they're moving with, with minor injuries. So they need much more by, by way of of reminding and prompting with their physiotherapy and exercise and rehabilitation to function properly. It goes in easily, but it falls out the other side more quickly than you might imagine. So they need more care with that. Now, talking a bit as if this is a disease process, but it isn't. It's actually, if you get the right circumstances and you get the right genetics, then you can have totally amazing performance, like Muhammad Ali here. If you don't believe he's hypermobile, look at the YouTube videos of him talking to Parkinson. He puts his hand up to his face and his fingers bend all over the place like that. Now, it doesn't sound so good that, um, you know, you bend like a looper caterpillar to get out of the way. It sounds better if you're floating like a butterfly, but <laughs> there's no floating there. He was a... Uh, Joe Frazier is wondering where that, where that punch has gone. Um, so he, he, the, he, the reason for his ability to be missed all the time is he could squirm out of the way uh, in the way that boxers can't usually. And I speculate and leave you with this thought, that uh, Richard III, who wasn't thought of much as a king at the time because he didn't have the usual kingly posture that people thought, was a devil when it came to fencing, and he could slide his blade under and over an opponent's weapon in a way that no one else could do. So perhaps he was the first and last hypermobile king in England. Thank you. <laughs>